who's in the house, it makes all the difference in the world who's living in a nation and running it. It makes all the difference in the world who's living in a city and running it. it. Makes all the difference in the world who's living in a home, a family's house, and running it. And it makes all the difference in the world, all the difference unto eternity, who's living in you and running you. Today marks the 80th anniversary of the liberation of the city of Paris from four years of brutal and oppressive German Nazi occupation on August 25th, 1944. The remaining occupation forces were defeated and expelled or captured in the city of Paris. Now, 80 years ago yesterday, General George S. Patton's U.S. Third Army, including my wife Nancy's dad, was rapidly approaching Paris from the northwest of France. If you know your World War II history, you'll know that Patton's Third Army, after arriving um, in Normandy in the middle of the summer, basically got the Allies out of the bog. The, the Allies had been bogged down and were slow moving out of Normandy after the D-Day beachhead. Things were not going well. When Patton and his Third Army arrived, he spearheaded the breakout and then went and took uh, Brittany and was moving through taking all of Northwest France. The Third Army, under the leadership of George S. Patton, quickly became the most lethal and feared military force in the world during 1944 and heading into 1945. So back to 80 years ago yesterday. On the 24th, emboldened by the fact that Patton and his now famous Third Army was rapidly approaching Paris and could be there within a couple to three days to help with any fighting that was necessary, if necessary, uh, the French resistance officers and generals who controlled the French resistance army that was at work outside and inside of Paris were emboldened to go ahead and move firmly and actually disobeyed orders from other Allied generals and took Paris uh, for real in the days of the 24th and the 25th of August. By the afternoon of the 25th, the Germans were completely routed and the French and a U.S. infantry division that had arrived in Paris on the 25th took control. Now, the photo there, if we go back to the photo, that is, uh, the, no, backwards, the parade uh, at the, uh, through the Arc de Triomphe down the Champs-Élysées, that's on actually the next day, uh, the 26th of August, when the supreme leader of the French resistance army, Charles de Gaulle, arrived and he, he led uh, the parade down the Champs-Élysées toward the Place de la Concorde for the big celebration at the Place de la Concorde. So that's what's going on on August the 26th. Meanwhile, Patton really didn't have time for a celebration since everything was secured in Paris. He simply uh, went on past and kept moving. And if we go to the map, the next, uh, the next slide is this map. It's still staggering to me. 80 years later, when I actually look at and when we consider what Patton did between August of 1944 and May of 1945, Patton basically with the Third Army led the taking of all of Northwest France, secured the situation in Paris, moved on, and actually broke the German uh, Moselle line at Lorraine in, in, in Eastern France. If you go, if you go to the next slide, you'll see some more photos. Over to the left, that's the uh, that's the Third Army in action. You know, house to house fighting in Lorraine, breaking, uh, preparing to break the Moselle line, which was really the line of defense of the Germans in France. You know, falling back from Normandy and such. 
And then Patton goes on and leads his, um, I mean, Patton didn't just cross the English Channel, the British Channel, he actually crossed the Rhine. Did you know that? I mean, he's like taking all of Germany anywhere he goes um, after leading his troops to be the spearhead of the victory at the decisive battle of, um, you know, in, in, in the winter of 1945, the Battle of the Bulge. He then moves on in, in, in from December of 44 into 45. He's moving on. His, there, that's, his, that's the Third Army crossing the Rhine River. That's the Third Army moving through eastern Germany and towards, and they actually take Czechoslovakia. I don't know if you know that. Patton goes into Czechoslovakia, takes Czechoslovakia, and was in total position to move and take most of eastern Germany and Berlin, but for political correctness reasons, he was held off. You may know this. And the Russians were allowed to take eastern Germany and Berlin. But anyway, that's, that's Pat. Now, just thinking about Nancy's dad being part of all this, I want to pull back and kind of remember his situation because in his work, in his life for that 10-month period, it really mattered who was in the house and pretty much every day who was in the house. It certainly made all the difference in the world back in Paris whether the German Nazis were in the house running Paris or whether uh, the French were. But just moving on in everyday combat, which is like, you know, when you're in the Third Army, you're pretty much fighting every other day, every day. And the issue is who's in the house. And this was particularly the issue for uh, Papa Nance because uh, he was a Ford Field artillery officer and Ford Field observer. And what do those guys do? Uh, let's go to the next photo yeah so what they are doing is their their job is to be out in front of the front lines they're at the point of the spear bracketing the enemy and confirming uh, targets for major artillery and air attack so that's what that's what he was doing so basically his life his lifestyle during this 10 months was he's either going to be at the very edge of the front lines or in many cases moving ahead of the front lines into neutral zone, contested zone, and in quite a few cases, actually finding himself through the shifts of battle, particularly in given cities and towns, being in enemy territory. So he's gonna move ahead, he's gonna set up his communication devices, and he's gonna be eyeing the enemy, and suddenly the enemy swoops back and takes a block or a house or a series of houses in, you know, with all the combat that's going on. And what that then led to is his stories that he would tell me about all these situations in which he would set up his communication lines and be bracketing the enemy as, you know, ahead of the front lines of the Americans, and suddenly the Germans take back over a block of a city. Suddenly the Germans move back into a house in many situations. In some situations, he would be down on, let's say, the bottom floor of a house, setting up, and suddenly, you know, kind of like the semi-cellar area of a house, he'd set up lines, uh, and, 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 you know, he'd be down below because it's safer with all the bombing and everything going on, a little bit safer. And, you know, he's looking out cracks kind of in the semi-cellar area, and suddenly there's, there's you know, foot, footsteps up above, and German soldiers are coming back in. And these guys all have grenades, so if they know he's down there, he's, he's, he's exploded, he's dead. And uh, he, he prayed a lot about who was in the house, who was going to be in the house, and who had moved back in the house in many of his situations in, uh, you know, battling from France through Belgium, Germany, Czechoslovakia. Who's in the house? It's a life or death question when you're involved in the fast-changing front lines of a war. Now, it was a, it's a life or death question for him when, you know, years later, as a middle-aged attorney in his 40s and 50s, he, he had a young daughter in the house suddenly, kind of a, a nice surprise there in his middle age. Um, there's spiritual warfare involved in parenting, too. Did you all know that? There's all kinds of stuff involved. It matters, then, whether you're raising children or fighting ahead of the front lines, sometimes finding yourself in enemy territory, who's up there in the house? Who's in the house? Which brings us to our sermon today. Test yourself. Who's living 
in you. Test yourself. Who's living in you? We'll turn now to our primary scriptures for today from Luke chapter 11, verses 23 through 26. And then also to 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Now, we've been in Luke chapter 11 for quite some time now, dealing with, among other things, Jesus' focus and connection of prayer and teaching us how to pray and pray for the kingdom with the fact that we are in spiritual warfare zone. We've talked about the mission of Jesus extensively over the last several Sundays, including Jesus Says Game On, the August 4th sermon, and all the way through where we've been. Now, today we're going to begin with the bridge verse that we looked at last week. Luke 11, 23, and then move on to 24 through 26. Here now God's word. Jesus says, whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. And then he abruptly moves on to this, picking up at verse 24. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest, and finding none, it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house swept and put in order. Then it goes and brings seven other spirits more evil than itself. And they enter and dwell there, live there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. And then did the Apostle Paul 2 Corinthians 13, 5, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you unless, of course, you fail the test? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. Who is in the house? Now today, what I want to talk to you about as we prepare to come to the Lord's table is we want you, I want myself, I want you to be fully filled by God, by the grace and power and presence of his Holy Spirit so that when any kind of demonic forces or spiritual forces checks it out, there is a no vacancy sign clearly on you. There's no room in here, no vacuum going on, no vacancy. Today we're going to talk about applying the scriptures that we just read. Number one, rescue does not necessarily mean regeneration. Rescue does not necessarily mean you're saved and born again. You may be saved from an immediate problem, but you're not saved unto eternal life. Rescue does not necessarily equal regeneration, being born again, being born anew. And clean up without Christ coming in is actually a catastrophe. It looks nice on the outside. It seems to fix a problem briefly, but it's actually worse than where you started from. That's according to Jesus. That's number one. Number two, a master lives in and rules you. That's just a reality that Jesus keeps telling us. The Bible tells us this. Whether we like it or not, whether we think, well, we're far past that kind of superstition or whatever, Jesus says this. The scripture tells us this all the way. A master is living in you, some kind of master. Number three, the test of your faith is this. Is Christ in you? If you want to know if you have saving faith, if you're really a Christian, here is the litmus test. Is Christ in you? And number four, the invitation of the gospel, and certainly as we come to the Lord's table today, offer yourself, and here's the good news, it's incredible, his promised presence will fill you. Now let's go to number one. Rescue does not equal regeneration. Doesn't necessarily equal regeneration. And a cleanup without Christ coming in leads to an even worse catastrophe. This is exactly what Jesus is saying when he talks about an unclean spirit who leaves a person, goes out, doesn't find a place where he likes to hang out, and so he says, look, I'm going to go back to my house. Notice that language. Jesus is very direct and blunt about that. The house still belongs to the spirit. Okay? I'm going to go back to my house. It's not your house. Not, you're not your own, right, if you, you belong to a spirit. I'm going to go back to my house, check it out. 
And he comes back and the, the, the house is swept and clean and kind of ready to host people. <laughs> and it looks great. The person is a right for the picking, right? All cleaned up, fixed some things with their marriage, with their problems, with this or that. Looking really good. And Jesus says what happens is the spirit says, oh, wow, this is awesome. What a great place to hang out. I'm going to get seven of my buddies. And you know, in, in the Bible, seven is a number of total completeness and total, and in this case, total control. I'm going to get seven of my buddies. So you're going to have eight. So seven, completeness plus one, right? Bonus thrown in there, occupying this person spiritually. And Jesus says the state of that person is worse than it ever was before the cleanup. Because a cleanup without Christ leads to an even worse catastrophe. See, this raises the question, look, to repent is to turn, to turn away from something. But the second part is key of repentance, to turn away from something to what or to whom. And if it, this is just a fleshly effort of, of me to fix my life, fix my marriage, fix my kids, fix my job, whatever, and I, I'm going to, like, New Year's resolutions, I'm really on this, I'm gonna, then I have not turned to the Savior. Okay? I may have turned from one problem into something actually, according to Jesus, that becomes much worse. You've dealt with people, I know I have years in pastoral ministry, people who turn from one addiction to another, right? Well, they've got the drug addiction or the pornography addiction, addiction, so then they become alcoholics, or then they become workaholics, or then they become, you know, obsessed with things, with material things, with success, and like get dominated by that. I also deal with the course years ago dealt with in my ministry at the Fresh Start Center when I actually, I was a lawyer, um, did that on a volunteer basis, but all these kind of jail cell, you know, repentances, salvations that in some cases are in some cases aren't, because a lot of times it's just turning away from something that's bad or scares you. You haven't actually turned to surrender to Christ and receive him. I've seen that with marriage situations, with people having trouble with their children. They want to fix the problem. I definitely see that all the time with people who are afraid of medical problems. And so they'll fix things. They will fix things. Did you hear that language? And this then, of course, reminds us, it runs all through the New Testament. Just for instance, 2 Peter 2, 20 through 22. For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome by them, the last state has become worse for them than the first, just like what Jesus is saying. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness. In other words, to get around the gospel and to hear what Bible is saying and say, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that. Um, then after knowing it, to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit, and the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. Second Peter 2. So that's, that's, a, that's a bracing reality that Jesus and the rest of the scripture give us. So that brings us to number two, a further reality. A master lives in and rules you. The question is, who's the master? According to Jesus and according to the Bible, there is some master who lives in you. And in fact, what Jesus is talking about here in this particular, just to kind of exegete Luke 11 for a minute, he's actually talking about an entire generation that's rejecting him. The majority is rejecting him. So he's actually speaking to an entire generation. That's part of the dynamic that's going on. He's speaking to individual members of the generation, but also to the whole generation. A master will inherit and occupy and dominate a generation. Did you know that our present generation is dominated by a master? Did y'all know that? Yeah. So, like what Paul says in Romans 14, 7, no one lives or dies to himself. You're not living to yourself. You may think you are, but somebody's manipulating that or somebody's saving you from that. You got two options here. None of us lives to himself. None of us dies to himself. No one is an unfilled vacuum. You host spirits and a master. The question is, which spirits and which master? 
if you host the Holy Spirit, we're talking about the spirit of wisdom and knowledge, counsel and such, um, Isaiah 11 too. And here's why, why? You say, well, why is that? Because that sounds kind of foreign. I haven't heard that a lot, or that's not the way I think as a modern or postmodern person. The reality is God created you. God created us for communion. For communion. You can fill in the blank here. This is the one blank on your handout notes today. God created us for communion to do what? To, can you fill in the blank now? To host, to host and commune with him. That's what we're supposed to do in the garden. You remember the garden of Eden, right? Adam and Eve are supposed to be prepared to host the Lord as he walks with them and fellowships with them. But what happens after they sin? They immediately don't want to host the Lord. They're hiding from the Lord. Do you remember this? They don't want to host the Lord. They, they, they hide from the Lord and don't want to have anything to do with the Lord. They want distance. They don't want this intimate hosting of the Lord. They don't want to commune with the Lord. That's a manifestation, of course, a fruit of sin. But see, back to the beginning, you and I were made to image God spiritually. We were made in the image of God, and we were made to image God, to reflect him, to reflect our maker, to reflect his goodness and his holiness. And here's the deal. If you stop imaging him, if you stop reflecting him, you're going to reflect someone or someone else. That's just a reality. Because I will have a master. Jesus says this in the New Testament. If you don't like all the spiritual talk, you know, let's just get down to something that almost everybody can understand. Because at one point, Jesus puts it like this. You're going to have a master. You're going to serve a master, Jesus says. And it's going to be one of these two masters. God or money. Now, when he says money, he's talking about mammon, like the spirit of money that controls people. You know, you, you're all about your money and your possessions, and it controls you from the inside out, and it's where you think you're banking your future. And, man, when you're dead, it's not going to save you at all. But, man, you can think money is it. I deal with a lot of people that think money's it. Okay? That is a – that's – the devil's pretty smart, so he can use that money thing according to Jesus, but you will serve one of two masters, God or money, according to Jesus. That's Luke 16, verse 13, and of course also in Matthew as well. Which then brings us to this, third, test yourself. Have you been testing yourself? Do you have the scan on this lately? What's the scan showing <laughs> from, from the inside of you? Paul says to do this, he commands this when he's being questioned about his own authority in 2 Corinthians 13, 5. And here is the test. The question of are you in the faith, according to Paul, is answered by this. Is Christ in you? If Christ is in you, you're in the faith. If Christ is not in you, you can say, well, yeah, I believe all these affirmations. I believe these concepts. If Christ is not alive in you, you're not in the faith in a saving way. That's what Paul is saying in 2 Corinthians chapter 13. So let me go to some diagnoses here. Number one, I'll give you this, the prayer test. The prayer test, now ask yourself this honestly. Do I pray more when I need help or when I've been helped? Do I pray more when I need help or when I've been helped? And let me go ahead and give you the kind of the cheat sheet on this you want to end up in B. You want to end up praying more when you've been helped than when you need help. I know that's counterintuitive for our flesh, but that is, that, that is a manifestation of actually loving and rejoicing in God and his saving grace when we pray more after we've been helped, because we've been helped in the celebration of his saving grace. Man, it is a sad situation. I can tell you this. I've dealt with this for decades now. When um, people ask for prayers, people inside the church and definitely people outside the church ask for prayers, and then all of a sudden, if they kind of get helped or if the diagnosis comes back, it's not quite as bad as they thought, they go radio silence. Or worse still, 
they will call and say, oh, don't worry about that. You can take me off the prayer list. It got fixed. I always tell the pastoral secretary, if you get that call, you need to put that person on hold and get them to me because they need to be spiritually re redirected. I mean, that is a hellish response. You understand that it's a damnable response to say, oh, don't worry about it. I got what I needed. She got healed or he got fixed, so take him off of prayer. Are you kidding me? Have you read the Psalms? The Psalms, yes, cry out for help, but are even more replete with celebrations of thanksgiving for what God has done. This is what people who actually love the Lord do. We should be totally, put, please put me on the prayer list for thanksgiving. God helped me in my medical situation. God helped my child. God helped my situation. I want to publicly profess how awesome God is. And if I've spent five weeks praying for help, I'm going to spend five years praising his name for what he did for me. That's an indication of, is Christ in you? Because this brings us to my next question underneath this number three. Is Jesus a means to my own end or my master? Is Jesus a means to my own end? In other words, do I use Jesus to get what I want, to get that relationship right, to get that test passed, to get that job, to get that health problem solved, to get my problem with my child fixed? Is he just a means to an end, or is he actually my master, the master inside me? Which gets us, of course, to the heart test. Do I love the gifts? or the giver more? Do I love the gifts or the giver? Really? We'll get to this months down the road, but in Luke 17, there's this exchange. It's not a parable, it's a real story. Ten lepers are crying out to Jesus for help. And Jesus doesn't really do anything except this. He commands them to go ahead and go to the priest to certify they've been healed. They're still lepers at this point, right? But all ten, listen to this, obey them. And you might tell me, well, pastor, that means they all believe. Y yeah, they believe that they can get helped, and they believe that Jesus has authority, but that's not saving faith at that point. So all ten obediently start making their way to the priest, and they're all immediately healed. And then one, only one, comes back to Jesus to spend more time than the healing on his knees before Jesus, praising Jesus. And it turns out in the story, we'll get to this later, but it's a Samaritan, which is shocking. It's not a Jew, it's a Samaritan doing this. And Jesus says, where are the other nine? Because see, Jesus wants to abide in his people. He, he's not a fixer. He's a savior. And is, so ask yourself, am I like the Samaritan, filled with grace and therefore overflowing with gratitude? See, if you're actually filled with grace, you will overflow also with gratitude and glorify God. So grace, true grace, leads to gratitude and glorification of God. You get this? All, all three of those go to there. That's why it's in the Heidelberg Catechism like that. Or am I like the many who use Christ to pray, to get grace, and then to take it for granted and to move on, run in my life? Which brings us then to the gospel invitation. Fourth, pray. Offering yourself to the Father, and this is awesome, his promised presence will fill you. He guarantees it. Present your body, present your whole self, and test and prove his presiding power in you. Pray offering yourself to the Father, just like he teaches us, Jesus teaches us, you all. Come together as the church and pray like this. Father, may your name be honored as holy. May your kingdom come. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. Pray like that. Pray giving yourself to the Father. Pray asking that his name would be hallowed, upheld, honored as holy inside of you and what you're doing. Pray offering yourself to the Father. As Paul says in Romans 12, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God. Not just thought patterns, but your whole body. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind 
so that, catch these verbs, by testing you may prove God's will, God's good, pleasing, and perfect will in you, in your life. So pray, offering yourself to the Father, and his promised presence will fill you. As Jesus says, the Father who is in heaven will give the Holy Spirit to those asking him. Ask and it will be given. Seek, you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. And here's the promise of Jesus recorded in Luke, excuse me, in John's Gospel, chapter 14, verse 23. This is over in John's Gospel. If anyone loves me, Jesus says, he will keep my word and my Father will love him and we will come to him and make our, catch this, make our home with him. Now, if you're like me, you might say, well, wait a minute. I'm not sure I can do that 100% of the time, keeping his word. I'm not sure how great I am. That's a good place to be. Humble yourself before the Lord. Not sure? Good. Well, then believe the good news. The Father, the Father will give you his spirit. You're not going to conjure it up. He will fill you with his spirit. See, who's in the house is a life or death question, not only in a communion Sunday, but every day we live. And it makes all the difference in the world who's in you. Pray to him that you might say with the Apostle Paul, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Test yourself. Who's living in you? And then hear the good news. This is incredible. This is Jesus speaking now to Christians, to the church, okay? In Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. Into you, brother and sister. And we'll dine with him and he with me. And so we look ahead to the incredible joy of what communion means. Christ in you. The hope of glory forever and ever. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org slash connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org slash give to give.